right, welcome to our sixth class regarding the selected topics in biopsychology. And in this class, we are going to make a brief introduction into the mental disorders, the foundations, research and progress. So, you know, how do we classify mental disorders and how actually uh, current uh, classification system, how current uh, research is approaching to understanding mental disorders. Is there a structure that are fitting to each other in terms of clinics and clinical diagnosis and uh, biological uh, uh, understanding or analysis? We will deal with all these uh, topics today. I mean, in general, I would say that anything that is dealing with the disorders of the brain could be considered as mental disorders, but somehow uh, brain diseases uh, are separated into different domains in medicine. One part is psychiatry, the other is in neurology. However, I am thinking that in the future, uh, not in the very near future, but in the future, we can uh, observe a fuse of the neuro, uh, neurology and medicine, um, psychiatry, probably. In the future, probably, we can observe that. And uh, especially when you see the current progress and when we actually analyze the current problems and when we actually be, when we will be able to solve those current problems about which I am quite hopeful. Uh, so we could also expect a kind of integration of neurology and psychiatry together. And also, I would like you to, uh, you know, pay attention that uh, psychiatric disorders are actually basically a medical problem. So there is nothing to be ashamed of. So as if like you have a problem like a diabetes or hypertension, you may also have a problem in some of the brain regions associated with certain behavioral functions or cognitive or perception. Uh, and that is natural. So that is that could happen. But we will also uh, talk about the stigma around uh, mental disorder. So when you broke your leg, uh, you break your leg and then you have, you know, you have a time to stay in bed or whatever. But when you are depressed or when you have a diagnosis of anxiety disorder, that is somehow hard to sometimes explain. We will talk about these things also today. So, and also, I would like you to pay attention on the fact that mental disorders are common. So these are common disorders. These are not rare disorders. So they are so common that I will later show you some slides that are one of the probably most, some types of mental disorders are probably the one of the most uh, common disorders among all disorders. Here is an example of the data from United States that the adults, about 20% of the US adults actually live with conditions related to mental disorders. AMI is, is a general category to describe any mental disorder, okay? And if you would like to actually a comparison, uh, overall 20%, but the females is, for example, if you would like to make a comparison, so the females is about 22% and the males are 15%. If you check the age, age-related distribution of the mental disorders, you see this is actually probably the highest age, 18 to 25. So how old are you guys? In this range, right? Okay, so if you don't have, uh, you know, if you pass these age ages and then you are fine, then it is like, you see, it's very, it's dropping to this stage somehow. Uh, that is interesting, of course. And of, in the, also when you look at the uh, distribution of uh, prevalence of mental disorders across the race and ethnicity, you're gonna find that, for example, the, uh, you know, for the Hispanic people, white people, it is like 20%. But there is no much difference between, for example, uh, ethnicity of uh, ethnicity regarding Hispanic and black people. So I wouldn't say that 15% and 16% are very significant differences. But uh, you see that there is this higher incidence for the uh, white uh, Caucasian population. But of course, one should really ask some questions regarding these data. 
Uh, you know, we always uh, talk about science in classes that you have to be very suspicious. You have to ask questions. You don't just believe what you see. So regarding female and male, uh, different, the, the difference between the rate of mental disorders between the female and males, one argument, especially for depress, depression, because depression is one of the most common type of mental disorders. So we could take maybe depression rates even higher compared to the males. Uh, but sometimes there is a speculation that uh, this may actually not really reflect the fact that males are less depressed compared to females, but males are maybe in ratio are uh, willing to get help less compared to females. Females are more open, females are more often visiting the doctors, more often getting the therapy, but rather males may have different mechanisms to cope with. Uh, you know, depression. And that could be maybe the reason why it looks like males look less in terms of depression. Yes? Why there is no uh, children's mental disorders? This is for adults. This is a study for adults. Uh, and uh, our subject is not actually the prevalence of uh, mental disorders. Just as an example, that's why uh, this is only for adult study. Why we don't keep the children in this category uh, there is one important thing, actually, it's a very good question, because, uh, you know, brain development is extremely complex and long process. And that's why children and developing uh, period of the brain and all associated disorders are uh, studied under a different category, not in the adults. That's why we have actually very strict differentiation between adulthood and, you know, developmental period. Because uh, I, I didn't talk about much about the brain development, but it is extremely complex, and there is a huge difference uh, between the things uh, during development and after development. That's why they are uh, observed under a different uh, category. All right, so. Ah, I also want to mention this. I am sure uh, these kind of data should have considered these factors that I was mentioning. For example, uh, probably males look like they have less depression because males look for less help. You can, uh, but probably uh, these data were considering that, uh, but this is highly uh, one of the important notifications about the higher rates of depression between females and males. But another thing, for example, if you look at here, why the whites are supposed to have significantly, I mean, 20%, 15%, you see this like very highest rates of uh, depression among, among the whites. Again, it could be because maybe they are more, uh, there is more access for maybe higher economic status people to reach the, you know, uh, therapy, to reach the uh, medical treatments. And that's why they are more frequently diagnosed because, you know, it's all about being diagnosed. So uh, if you are diagnosed, you are diagnosed. If you are not diagnosed, but still you are depressed, who is going to identify and put it into the statistics? So, but I imagine that such a data should have already considered this, uh, discrepancies as well, because this is a data from the, you know, National Institute of Mental Health, one of the uh, uh, institutions with highest authority in terms of mental health. But I just want to take your attention into these factors. Uh, yes, and uh, if you would like to speak in terms of absolute numbers, because previously I was showing the uh, rates, so it's like in the US, for example, more than 50 million people. And actually it is, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people are being, uh, having these difficulties, as you can see with this actor who was actually uh, explaining and mentioning that he was having this condition called obsessive compulsive disorder. So it's a type of mental disorder in which a person has certain thoughts repeatedly that he's like, you know, these are called obsessions. So unwanted thoughts are coming to your mind, but it's not like just comes to your mind. It just it blocks you. It, you cannot do anything else than thinking of that something you find maybe unethical, you find inappropriate, or some fears that you're going to die because you touch something which is supposed to be infected. 
and then you have these thoughts like you know breakouts for two three weeks you cannot think of anything else than this threat and or compulsions that you know you need to repeat certain patterns but it can be without obsessions or uh, compulsions. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, different people have different variations. So some people have only obsessions. So, uh, some people have compulsions. Some people may have both. And uh, yes, another celebrity who actually mentioned personally that uh, she suffered from the post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety. We are going to talk about those kind of diseases and their definitions later, but I just want you to show that. So what are the types of mental disorders? How do we actually classify them? What is the classification of depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder? So, you know, the current classification systems can be actually uh, described as two. One of them is the one is called uh, ICD-10. ICD-10 is the International Classification of Diseases, which is actually proposed by World Health Organization. And the other one is the American Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, simply DSM. And these uh, disease classification systems are basically the guidelines by which uh, clinicians, the psychiatrists, you know, follow in order to make a clinical decision and diagnosis on the state of a certain patient, okay? And for example, they have, uh, I mean, there is no much difference between ICD-10 and DSM. I mean, if medicine and medicine, of course, you would not expect major differences, right? Because it has to be standard. Uh, but uh, for example, for the DSM, there is the like list of diseases like 297. So we mostly hear anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, whatever, but actually the official, you know, disease types are uh, in this number, almost 300 different kind of diseases and their subtypes. And uh, however, uh, one thing that I want to tell you in the most fundamental level, these two systems are more or less the same because they are based on the uh, clinical uh, picture and the uh, clinical phenotype of the diseases, okay? So, uh, and in this aspect, these classification systems are quite, re are quite reliable. What does it mean reliable? That means that, for example, a medical doctor in Russia using this system for one patient can make a decision uh, which, which, is, can be, which can be repeated by another doctor for the same patient using the same criteria. So different people can reach the same clinical uh, evaluation or assessment or diagnosis with the use of the same, uh, uh, same system for the same patient. So that means these are reliable, working very well, and clinically it's very useful. On the other hand, the problem with this current system is they are not validated biologically. We will talk about more later. Actually, as I remember in uh, Russian psychiatry, we have a <coughs> category of neurotic disorders. And as I remember, in a lot of countries like Europe, uh, states, they abandoned this theory of neurotic disorders. There is a difference. So I don't know the Russian system. Uh, probably in Russia, they should also use this similar kind of uh, disease classification. Uh, uh, they, uh, I think so. Uh, because, uh, I mean, usually medicine is a standard. Uh, uh, so, these classification systems can be basically characterized as clinically reliable, but not validated biologically. I will explain later what does it mean, not validated biologically. But uh, what do I mean actually, simply just as an example that, for example, I want you to give, I want to give a very simple example of how precision medicine in a very simple way should be working. Let's say you, you have a pain in your throat, 
okay, and you have some fever. Okay, if you have fever, there could be many reasons for the fact that you have a fever, right? Uh, and you really have to know what the reason is. Is it a hormonal uh, problem? Is it something because of stress? But if you have also aching here with the weakness and everything, that means that you may have an infection in this area. So typically what would happen, you would go to doctor and the doctor would uh, going to take a sample from this area. And that sample is actually supposed to have some uh, bacteria that are actually, uh, you know, uh, here infecting this area. And they will actually uh, culture those bacterial sample and they will analyze which kind of bacteria you have in your body. Okay, and that is like, you know, a kind of a diagnostic tool. So they will determine which kind of bacteria you have. And according to that, they will prescribe the antibiotic that is working best for that type of bacteria. All right. So there is a test. There is an objective marker. There is a way how to actually classify the bacteria. And there are known groups of antibiotics working for which kind of uh, bacterial species, okay? So that is the way how should be, in the most simple way, how a medical practice should be working. But sometimes it's not possible because the disease itself is very complex. And actually, we don't know how, why these diseases are really happening in a very precise way. We don't know. And that is the case for the majority of the psychiatric disorders, I would say. Still, so because of that, uh, the best way of classification of the disorders is the current system that we have. And that is very useful for the clinical reliability. So we have to stick to that until we can uh, develop better classification systems. So for the classification of mental disorders, if you look at the, uh, you know, uh, these almost 300 disorders are actually classified according to the SM in different axes, axis one, two, three, four, five. And majority of the, you know, mental disorders are falling to this axis one, except for the personality disorders, for example. Uh, now, I want to give a break to the classification issue or reliability, validity regarding the classification, but I would like to take your attention on the stigma around the mental disorders. So, unfortunately, stigma uh, is huge. Stigma can be defined as when someone sees you in a negative way because of your mental illness, when they have a prejudice, which is an unfair and unreasonable opinion, feeling especially when formed without enough knowledge about you. Just they think that you have a mental disorder and then you are done for them. And then, you know, it could uh, cause discrimination. Discrimination is when someone treats you in a way negatively that uh, because of your mental illness. And the worst of it, people who are actually having a mental disorder are under the risk of generation of a self-stigma. Stigma is a situation when somebody actually developing prejudice and negative ideas about themselves because of mental disorder of their own. And then that is very hard. That is very hard uh, mechanism to cope with because that makes everything worse. Because those people start to think that, okay, public believes people with mental illness are weak or dangerous or whatever. Okay, then that's right. People with mental illness are weak or whatever is thought to be for that particular disease. And then, okay, I am mentally ill, so I must be weak. And then, because of because I am weak, I'm not worthy able. So then, oh, why I should try? And that will be actually making everything worse. On the other hand, highly creative people, for example, enormous, uh, you know, uh, uh, highly creative people have higher rates of certain forms of mental disorders. Uh, studies show that studies regarding the biography of the accomplished artist have shown that rates of major depression are about 10 times higher than in general population. Okay, so people who are creative, artistically creative, they are more likely to be depressed according, uh, compared to the general population. 
But what is more interesting is the bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a disease which has different stages of depressive, depressive and manic episodes. Depressive episodes are the ones that can be characterized as being sad, without energy, feeling uh, you know, loss of appetite about everything. And then after this episode, there is this manic episode, which is like very active. You don't sleep. Maybe you don't, you talk all the time. You work a lot. You are, you, do, you feel very strong. Okay, this is uh, some characteristics of the bipolar disorder. And that is, uh, you know, for 30 times more for people who are artists, who are actually creative. Excuse me? I thought this is a stereotype. No, it is not. This is actually the textbook example. These are not stereotypes. So these are the statistics. Uh, so actually here I would like to show you Robert Schumann, the romantic composer, German. Here is his depressive and uh, manic episodes in his life, during his life. So when he has the manic episodes, his productivity was actually extremely high with his composing uh, style. And that is a textbook example to show uh, actually for the you know, uh, productivity of the artistic people. Uh, with, this, uh, with this statistic, I wouldn't say mental disorders in general are more... Uh, common in the artistic people. I wouldn't say that, and I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm just saying that some uh, forms of, certain forms of mental disorders, and especially 10%, maybe not very significant, but 10 times, but 30 times is very, very significant for people with bipolar disorder. And a lot of people, I mean, I know most of the famous authors, artists uh, associated with mental disorders, even you know, starting from Van Gogh to Dostoevsky. So that doesn't mean that people without mental disorders wouldn't be artists, <laughs> but there is a correlation for the bipolar disorder, which is significant. And this was actually done with, uh, you know, uh, this is something not a, a popular belief. This is taken, whatever I teach here is taken from the uh, textbooks or publications. Yes. So this guy in the next slide has uh, the second type of bipolar disorder. I don't see many. <laughs> we are not interested in which type of bipolar disorder he has. Here we are trying to say that a certain form of mental disorders are more common, and that is bipolar disorder. I don't know. I'm not a clinician. I'm neurobiologist, so I, can, I cannot answer specific questions regarding the disease types. And I'm really not interested in that. So, uh, but if you ask pathophysiology, I can speak a lot. So pathophysiology of mental disorders, because that's a topic of research. I'm a researcher. I'm not a clinician. There's a big difference. So I cannot uh, talk about uh, disease types. I mean, if I want, I can, but I am not. I don't have even authority for that. For that, you need to be a medical doctor, and I'm not. I am a scientist. So I would like to come back to this slide, which I was showing you in the first class. Do you remember that? So this is for me very landmark slide because it shows the situation of uh, you know brain disorder psychiatry in about you know hundred years ago, and that was like you know I on one hand I really appreciate Freud and his you know extreme power of his observations and of his works, but I also should mention that the psychoanalysis somehow was taken and absorbed so much in the psychiatric circles that it was like causing a kind of a trend in which the brains and brain disorders or brain way of thinking for a psychiatric disease have been seriously ignored. So that was uh, not a good thing, uh, uh, to be honest. And Freud himself was actually not on this idea of ignoring the brain. He himself was thinking that brain and brain physiology is important. But somehow there was such a trend, although, for example, people like Emil Krepelin already, which is in the same generation with Freud, speaking the same language, living exactly in the same geographic location, or at least similar uh, continents, uh, the same continents, uh, they were never meeting physically or even, uh, you know, uh, theoretically. So that was like such a parallel way. And that, that there was this, you know, psychoanalytic uh, invasion 
of the understanding of mental disorders, which took place a very long time, which actually uh, somehow made psychiatry uh, much more different than the rest of the medical uh, practices. Because as I showed before, in the 1950s, this is a landmark paper in which, you know, it is like, the term molecular disease is not an ordinary term here. It's a significant, uh, uh, you know, indication that actually medicine is already being transformed into a science, into a field driven by molecular biology. But that was not the case for psychiatry. Look at the book titles, as I already showed you before. So, so psychotic states can be actually, this is a book that describes how psychotic states can be, uh, you know, resolved psychoanalytically, for example. But in the meanwhile, in the 1950s, there were also some important discovery of the drugs. Uh, in the psychiatry. So now it uh, it's may appear a little like contradictive. How come psychiatry is now psychoanalytically based? And then on the other hand, there are those drugs that were discovered, right? But to be honest, I tell you, these drugs were not discovered by the use of uh, validated drug targets. What is a validated drug target? Is like, you know, what, what is the main reason? biologically causing that disease, and then you target, you develop a pharmaceutical agent that could actually, you know, fix that problem. No, they are not developed as a result of that, but they were mostly developed by chance. And that is a term that we use for the discovery of the drugs that were developed by chance, serendipity in drug uh, serendipity in drug discovery implies the finding of one thing while looking for something else. So the majority of the psychiatric drugs in the 1950s were discovered as a result of this kind of attempts. Here a few examples for lithium, for depression, for schizophrenia. And actually now, almost more than 50 years later, most of the current drugs are just the version of these prototypical drugs, to be honest. And that's not an optimistic picture. That's not what we would like to see in the post-genomic period. What is post-genomic period? We will talk later. But I want to show you this drug, which is another, uh, maybe a new, new generation of drugs. Before, after these drugs, then we had in the 1980s, <laughs> Uh, you know, Prozac with the chemical uh, commercial name, sorry. And that was like representing the group of drugs called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, yeah, that was so popular. That was like even there were movies about this drug uh, because that was sold so much. Uh, but after that, you know, we have something even new. Have you heard of ketamine? Yeah. Ketamine, uh, how did you, how you get to know about ketamine? Some of my friends use this like a drug. <laughs> yes, because it's a kind of a club drug sometimes, but it has a lot of side effects. But it was discovered that actually ketamine has also some impact on the, uh, you know, uh, on the, uh, progress on the positive uh, treatment of depressive symptoms. And that was very interesting because what is very interesting for ketamine that it shows its effect in a very short time. Normally antidepressants show their effect at least three weeks. And then even after it, there is no guarantee, then you will have another drug because it doesn't work. So it's like a trial and error strategy that's going on at the moment. So they just don't give you drug to know that it will work for sure. You have to spend a few weeks to see if it works or not. If it doesn't work, they, they will give you another one until they find some benefits if, uh, for a certain drug. That is the problem associated with the lack of uh, validated drug tar targets, associated with the you know, genetic variations of individuals that respond to drugs differently. So we have a lot of problems. But the good thing is we are aware of these problems and uh, we are working to solve these problems. So I'm not really pessimistic while explaining all these problems. But what is interesting for ketamine is that so far, these drugs, for example, these are all working on the, you know, catecholaminergic system. 
But this, and they, it takes quite a long time for these drugs to show their uh, effect on depressive disorders, for example. And then you have this, and that drug is actually working completely on a different, working on a system which is actually not the ones uh, that were targeted by other drugs. And that is even working much faster. So uh, that also makes the whole story and the whole ideas about the pathophysiology of depression much more complicated because previously people thought that there is a relation between serotonergic system and depression, but now why, if it is a direct relationship, why it takes three weeks for people to get better, uh, although, uh, you know, consistent drug treatment. And then you find out this drug is actually acting much quicker than other drugs, which are working on completely different brain systems. Do you remember the NMDA receptors that are involved in long-term potentiation in hippocampus during learning and memory? <sighs> so the whole story is now, you know, uh, again, even becoming more complex than. Every time with the new information, it becomes more complex for depression. But for other diseases also, it's not uh, really very different. So considering other mental disorders. So we need rational drug design. So rational drug design requires validated drug targets. That requires to understand everything very well, to understand the system very well. We still don't know enough to have validated drug targets. All right, we need to define mental disorders with biomarkers. What's a biomarker? Is a broad subcategory of medical science that is objective, indications of medical state observed from outside of the patient. So you don't go and ask patient, how do you feel? You feel depressed. Or if the patient is real, is not able to differentiate real between unreal, oh, he's in the psychotic episode. I mean, it is very easy to understand these things, but you, you see then if we, can, if we can understand so easily and why the drug responses uh, occur in some group of patients and it doesn't occur in our other group of patients. So that means we really ha need a very uh, objective and specific that is enough to separate different disease types. And that can be only achieved by the development of biomarkers. Here, of course, say, coming from outside the patient means, of course, not outside the patient, just not uh, the symptoms, uh, but from the blood, from the DNA, from the brain scan. Uh, these are the biomarkers that we look for. So the outside shouldn't be misunderstood. Well, and because of the lack of validated drug targets, because of the lack of the biomarkers uh, that we can see also in this slide, uh, there is a huge increase. This is a data from 1990s to actually beginning of 2000, and it's actually a little older data. However, the current situation, I don't think that it really changed drastically. So what can you see with this uh, actually uh, diagram is the fact that there is an increase in the total number of studies related to, for example, cognition and schizophrenia, but a uh, number of human clinical trials, which means the reflection of these findings into the medical practice is almost none. Why? So if these things are okay, there must be a positive reflection in the clinics. No, no any solution, no any drug. It's like a situation which we call as translational bottleneck. Okay, so in our context, when we say translational, translational potential, we want to say that basic research should be translated into clinical practice. If not, there is a bottleneck there. So I would say that psychiatry does not seem to benefit from post-genomic era as desired. That is a word. But what is post-genomic era? So this period refers to the time period from, the, from after the completion of human genome project to the present day, okay? Because that is a huge progress in understanding of not only our you know, genetic makeup, but also understanding of diseases. 
all right? So that's why we are in this, uh, you know, post-genomic period in which there are much more information. And post-genomic period is amplified by other tools in different fields of neuroscience as well. If, if you would like to consider this period for the brain research, but post-genomic period is also useful for cancer research, for any kind of diseases. But we are focusing on the brain diseases. That's why I would like to focus on brain disorders. But uh, also, I would like to explain you the current trends in medicine. Where does medicine go? How is medicine benefiting from the current progress? So medicine is being transformed. And what are, the, what are these transformation? I would simply say that personalized medicine. What is personalized medicine? That is, you know, you use the genetic information of each individual in order to identify the disease risks before the person is supposed to get sick. You identify the risks, and then you take the preventative uh, precautions, okay? That is one way of using personalized medicine because each of us have different risks of developing, for example, mental disorders or any kind of complex disorder. Or diagnosis. So each of us have a unique situation. It's usually diagnosis has to be really done in a very, you know, in a very specific way. And we have now these tools more than ever. That's why it will be also in a very personalized way for each individual. And treatment. Treatment is especially very important because, you know, even how you metabolize the drugs may be different from one person to another. Because drug metabolizer enzymes are encoded by genes which have genetic variations. And each of us inherit different variation. And that's why we actually metabolize the drugs in different rates. And different drugs will have also different impact on our drug metabolizer enzymes, which will actually completely change everything from person to person. Until this personalized pharmacogenetics approach, that could be also called pharmacogenomics or pharmacogenetics, drugs were prescribed according to average values. So there are clinical studies, and according to that, there is an average value, and based on that, doctor is going to prescribe an average, and then maybe you will have some problems, and then maybe they will adjust it and whatever. That causes, of course, time, energy, resource waste. And now the trend is actually, you know, to improve the treatment in terms of uh, genetic profile of each patient, because each patient has different, uh, as I said, way of responding to same drug, even for the same disease condition. So you may have same disease condition with another person, you may need same drug with another person, and still your body can respond differently uh, to that drug compared to other person. And for that, you need a genetic profiling, and that, that is a field called uh, pharmacogenetics. And here, uh, actually, I was so far mostly talking about the genomics, genetic profiling, and using that information for the diagnosis, uh, for prevention, for uh, treatment of the patients. But that is not limited to only the genetic uh, information. We are in the period of omics. So what was before is genomics, but actually we have metabolomics, we have transcriptomics, we have genomics, of course. We have epigenomics as well. So these are all, you know, uh, the collection of all different forms of uh, molecular uh, profile of an individual for a given state. And according to that, uh, they evaluate and have your data. And for that uh, data, uh, that data are going to be used in order to assess your disease condition and find the best treatment solution, okay? So that is a, uh, that is a field that we can call as precision medicine. And that is the trend in medicine. Now let's come back to uh, how, uh, let's come back to this slide uh, as an example from which we, everything started with the morphology, let's say, in the cancer diagnosis to the 
precision medicine. So I want to compare how the medicine before, because you are not expert in medicine, so I want to show you this slide that how the medicine before and how is medicine is transforming into, you know, precision medicine. So, for example, this is a, a timeline for the cancer treatment. For the cancer treatment, you know, usually in the beginning, until the 1970s, they were taking, uh, you have a tumor in your body and that tumor is, a, is taken. And then it was studied under the microscope in terms of morphology. This is an example for the diagnosis for the breast cancer, for example. Later, starting with this 1970s, uh, not morphology, but maybe more, more molecular, like biochemistry, like, you know, existing of, for example, estrogen receptor status was actually a marker to use uh, to, in order to diagnose a disease state regarding uh, um, breast cancer. Then in this example, you are going to have some other kind of proteins together with estrogen receptors because probably there are more information that was possible to use to, you know, find the subtypes because you, you know, there are many subtypes of breast cancer. So not every person who has a tumor has the same. So tumor with the morphology, you cannot know, you cannot find the real target uh, to you know, treat. So you need refinement. And that refinement was actually differentiating into a status that today we are able to differentiate or separate or subtype the breast cancer uh, biopsies based on its genomic landscape. We say genomic landscape because it's not really a linear thing. And that is very specific for each kind of diseases. So that is an example how uh, actually medicine is evolving from this stage, uh, from the 1970s to the current stage in which we have a much more detailed analysis and opportunities in the post-genomic period. Why I show this? Because I don't separate psychiatry and psychiatric disorders from oncology disorders. I believe that psychiatric disorders should also have this kind of way of assessment, evaluation, and treatment. But we don't. We don't. We don't, and actually the majority of the drugs approved to treat depression over the past few decades have been the drugs with similar structures and functions that were discovered in the 1950s. So somehow I'm trying to prove that my idea that psychiatry does not seem to benefit from a post genomic era as desired is actually shown. How, how is the situation now? How, the, how actually the medicine is evolving? But what is the situation in the psychiatry despite a huge progress in the neuroscientific research and molecular biology? On the other hand, mental illnesses are serious burden today. I was talking mostly about the stigma. I was talking about the prevalence. But what about the burden? What about the cost uh, in always, the cost of mental disorders today? It is a global, serious global disease burden. Serious global disease burden. But first, I should maybe define you certain terms. So one of, one of them is YLL. Okay, the years of life lost due to dying early is a measure of disease burden. You know, some diseases like cancer may actually cause you die younger than it should be, than you, should, you could. Uh, maybe mental disorders cause that kind of thing or not, but mental disorders may cause some other kind of burden, and that is YLD the burden of living with a disease or disability is measured by the years lost due to disability. So there is an obvious burden, there is an obvious stress of the mental disorder, both on the individual, both the circle of the individual, and both uh, on the society. Okay, but for the individual, so how, uh, you have to consider it that years lived with an obvious disability. Okay, so this is the way how people actually have this kind of, uh, 
you know, analysis for the burden of diseases, and you know, there are global data to explain the burden of diseases. You know, some data, you know, they take all the diseases and they do statistics in terms of the burden per year. All right, and they found out that what are the diseases that are most early causing the highest rates of burdens in terms of, for example, years lived with disability. And for mental disorders, I would like to especially show you these data are for depression. So depression among the, but I have to show you actually the more than 200, almost 300 different diseases are calculated in terms of burden in terms of years lived with disability. For depression especially, you have to consider this because it may not cause you die, at least significantly, except for the risk of suicide. But in terms of years of disability, uh, among all, uh, all diseases, for example, in the 1990s, it was number third, and today, in the, in the 2019, it is rated as a uh, top second disease that caused the highest rate of burden in terms of years lived with disability. That's a very significant problem. That's a very serious, significant problem. This is a summary I put for you, for your notes later in the, in the class, but here also, you know, the global landscape for people. Uh, but that is, you know, uh, that is also including the death rates. That's why it looks, the impact looks less because uh, that because of depression. If you look at this list, for example, there is, uh, this, is the con uh, this is the combination of this, this and this together. And when you take this into account, time uh, death, death rates, of course then the, uh, the burden goes to uh, uh, le less lower ranks in the, in the ranking among the all disorders. But we are not talking in terms of that, we are talking in terms of the years lived with disability. Uh, and that is very significant. In the second graph, it is mostly concentrating on years with disability together with the you know, years that could cause the death. And for that one, maybe it doesn't look very dramatic, I was also checking uh, uh, Russia, Russian Federation region. Maybe it doesn't look so dramatic, but we have to consider. I didn't have, I couldn't find the other graph. There was no uh, graph, graph for the years with years lived with, uh, you know, disability, at least in this database. But I would, I will upload this into into our system, then you can check these databases by yourself where you can actually find a lot of different entries for different uh, disease cases and their burdens. <sighs> okay, enough for that. So why? I mean, uh, on one hand, we have, uh, you know, the omics technologies. We have uh, the medicine that is evolving from, uh, you know, uh, from one state to a completely uh, a new area or a, a stage that we can describe as personalized medicine. And in the meanwhile, for psychiatric disorders, we don't have maybe much bright situation. Why? That is a question that we want to talk. Why? Before going to uh, actual reasons, because this reason is a general reason for all kinds of diseases, but I want you to be aware of this. Drug discovery itself a very, very challenging task, very difficult. If you are not convinced, I would like to show you this slide, where you see actually, you know, <clears throat> so the drug discovery starting, you, you know, you don't have any idea, you are just, you know, working in the laboratory. So, the discovery and preclinical studies here could take six years, even longer, okay? So just to find a candidate, or some candidates even, like you start with actually, you know, 5,000 to 10,000 different drug candidates, NCE, new uh, chemical entities, is just different drug candidates that are thought to be maybe important to solve a current disease state. So you start like this amount of different molecules, 
you go, you work in the lab every bloody day, and they said a lot of time and energy because I work in the lab, I know how it is. So here it is only mentioned in terms of time, in terms of cost, and it is not mentioned in terms of frustration of each individual working in the lab. So you have eventually come to the stage that you have now 250 drug candidates, and after that you have initially come to the clinical stage, which you enter with five to 10 strong candidates. And you have to also have to think of the animal testing and animal experimentation in this situation. And after that, you have the clinical studies, which would take six, seven years, okay? And after that, eventually you may have, or mostly not, nothing, but if you are lucky, you may have one, two approved drugs, but approval will also take a lot of time, okay? And eventually, you will develop one single drug. And that is, you see, you have to consider like 10 years just to develop one drug. You have to consider a lot of capital. How much? I put it for you. So first of all, just to, for this stage, starting from here to here, it would cost minimum 1.8 billion US dollars. But think about the background. Think about already having an established pharma company. Think about their research budget. Think about everything. Research is very expensive. So research requires first establishment of laboratory, which is a huge money. And that laboratory, in order to work, it is constantly based on raw materials and chemicals and kits and test products. That's very expensive to keep the laboratory running. And for an established, established, I'm not talking about the zero company, for an established large pharmaceutical company, they have to have a budget which is 50 billion USD per year, just for that. In that budget, you have to spend this amount for just one drug. So, and, and the time, and the frustration. So that is one thing that you, it's not easy to have a drug. It's not easy to develop a drug. Now, we open a specific window for the psychiatric drug issue, why we cannot have. So it's even more difficult. So drug development is already difficult for all fields. But for psychiatry, we have extra uh, additional difficulties, and that is the complexity that we are faced with. But it is not difficult to understand. Brain is supposed to be considered as the most uh, you know, complex matter in the known universe. So of course, it's not easy. Uh, that I could imagine. But at least we are aware of this kind of complexity, at least in terms of uh, medical uh, resolvement. Uh, otherwise, the complexity of the brain can be studied in different levels of complexity, and each time it can end up with different com complexities. The complexity I mention here are the complexities that are associated with uh, the diagnosis and treatment of mental disorders. Other than that, there are many complexities, actually. So, But let's focus on these complexities only, and that is complexity of the multiple factors causing the mental diseases. Uh, that is even more complex than any other disease. And the other one is the complexity of the psychiatric phenotypes that I can summarize maybe most briefly in this form. So what do we mean about the complexity of the mental disorders I show you, you see here. You know that the behavior is the product of gene environment interactions. We studied that in different examples for actually normal state of behavior, for intelligence, for committing a, a crime, right? But also in general, today we know that there are different kinds of diseases. Some diseases are genetic diseases. They only occur because of genetic factors and sometimes even just single mutation. So very easy and that follows Mendelian genetics pattern. On the other hand, there are diseases that are, because, that are happening because of the environmental factors. So COVID-19 is an environmental disease. So then we have 
in between the complex diseases. And that is where actually most of all psychiatric disorders fall into complex. So there are genetic factors, there are environmental factors. Each of these factors by themselves are also extremely complex. And that is the problem. I think it is very clear for each of you that the environmental factors should be very complex, the way in which we live in. And that is also, you know, the developmental stages are also differential. So developmentally and in the adult state, how environment is going to uh, impact on us will be different. So you can understand that environment starting from all kinds of things that we are exposed since we are an embryo until this point. That is the environment. That is not only how your, whether your parents are separated. Environment is, you know, if you were infected while you were a fetus, for example, some mental disorders have been found to be associated with some kind of virus, viral infections, because ma mother has that virus, and that was actually somehow, uh, you know, trans, uh, trans it was infecting also the baby for example, or embryo, and that causes some kind of disorders. They found uh, in the genetic uh, analysis that there are some viral genome that has been found in certain uh, diseases in the patients, for example. So, but that is not a direct genetic factor. That is a disease that came to you from outside. So when we say genetic factors, we talk about the ones that you inherited. But your genetic factors are not constant. They can also be changing because of the factors that are actually acting on you. That is another thing that is making the genetics even more complex. But here, forget about all these things coming from the outside and impacting on your genetic makeup. I'm talking about the genetic that you inherited and that are impacting in your uh, brain fun function and behavior. That genetics for any kind of maybe most uh, well-known mental disorders is not simply a genetics. Today we call them as an architecture. So it is like a very dimensional way of multiple of genes and their activity levels supposed to be considered. The second problem now. So I told that gene environment interaction and their complexity is one big problem. And the second problem is actually the genotype phenotype relationship. Genotype is an organism's hereditary information. Okay, and the phenotype is an organism's actual observed properties, such as morphology, development, or behavior. So the visible phenotypes for mental disorders or for you know, behavior is the behavioral state, right? And that is very complex. First of all, the genes directly encode the behavior in such a way. There are many, many other systems. And plus, there is an environmental impact that is huge, and this relationship is not linear and is not made by just one single factor. And that is the problem, because in biological research, we need to define a genotype-phenotype relationship in order to solve. Does that mean that there is no such a relationship in psychiatric disorders? No, there is, but it is too complex. It is too complex, so there must be some maybe other methodological uh, tools must be developed, a novel tool should be developed, or for different tools should be developed in order to approach this complexity. And that is being developed, don't worry, by the way. So here in this example, uh, I show you actually how neurobiologically we work in general but also uh, how actually neurobiologically you find new drugs. So you see there is a human psychiatric disease and then there must be gene discovery. So if you Google the genes associated with schizophrenia, you will find a lot of different genes, right? Have you ever checked? No. I don't know, why? So many different things appear, right? There is no uniform, something consistent. So many different things. And that is a problem because 
of many problems associated with, first of all, even the disease classification. Disease classification, as I explained, is not based on biological markers, but something completely in a different field, different criteria. Based on those criteria, you want to find a biological relationship. Of course, it's not possible. It gives always different results. Because criteria is not biologically valid. It is clinically reliable. It's only for clinic. But we don't have something better. That's why there were so many studies that people just compare, uh, compare the genetic makeup of disease case with the normal case, and they found out which genes are more associated with a certain disease. These are called association studies, genetic association studies. But each different genetic association study will end up different kind of uh, genes. And each time you, you would at least now, now they stop it. The popular science even stop it because they understand, understood that that's not the point. But before maybe 2000, uh, it, it was like a new gene associated with schizophrenia has been found. Each time there is a new gene. So we have problem already this stage because of the reasons I explained. So there is a genetic makeup. Why? How do we know there is a genetic background? Because of studies, twin studies, you know, heritability studies, they show that for schizophrenia there is a strong genetic component. But what is that genetic component? We cannot find reliably. That is the problem. If you find that, which is probably multiple genes, like an architecture, when I say multiple genes, it's even simple. I would say like a genetic architecture. Then we would like to model this in the laboratory animals. So we know the genetic engineering techniques, we know genome editing technologies, then we just create the, that's, uh, that genetic uh, vulnerability in the brain of the mouse, in the live animal, and then we study on different uh, drugs and pathophysiological conditions and can develop better medicines. But here we have already bottlenecks at these stages. This is another example to show you. Actually, this is, uh, you know, top-down and bottom-up research. What is top-down and bottom-up? In the top-down research is actually you start from the patient groups. But the patient groups are not patients that are classified according to uh, uh, biological criteria. On the other hand, today, uh, because all these problems were recognized in the scientific circles, of course there were some you know, ways to solve these problems so that I have been uh, trying to explain. Why it has been so hard to find the drugs for psychiatric conditions because of all these reasons that I discussed, and I hope it makes sense. But those problems are being recognized for a while. That's why there are solutions to solve these problems. Now I would like to uh, put, uh, explain very briefly those uh, developments or solutions or tools which actually aim to you know, uh, resolve these bottlenecks that I was summarizing. And, uh, that perhaps uh, uh, because I don't want to look pessimistic. On the other hand, I am extremely op optimistic, but we need time. We need time for sure. Uh, this is uh, actually, uh, when I talk about the animal uh, experimentation, I wanted to show you, for example, this is an experimental paradigm to test. This is called forced swim test. Okay, so to which extent is animal actually, you know, depending on the, you know, uh, drug effect, to which extent is animal is struggling to stay in the, how long it will struggle to stay on the surface until when? It sounds like a, a little wild experiment, right? Huh? Uh, no, I mean, uh, neuroscience research, uh, we have to work with animal models, as I explained. But that's why we were target of animal rights activists a lot. 
So I remember, for example, when I was a doctorate student, uh, there was an uh, animal facility and there, there are all these animals stored. And then once we need to do an experiment, then we need to go there to pick up. We order and then we pick it, pick it up. But the way how we pick it, pick it up is not a normal way. So we had a cage, you know, you put the mouse in a cage, you know, cage, oops. Uh, but we don't carry the animal on the cage and we walk in the campus. It was in Heidelberg, Germany. All the buildings were actually connected underground. Like, you know, there was, I don't know, maybe thousands of buildings that were connected from the underground. So there is a connection to go underground from everywhere. Not, you don't have to go outside. But for, in order to pick up the laboratory animals, we had to go from the underground with a cage which is closed that cannot be visible. And then we go and we pick up because they were uh, protesting a lot. Uh, well, I am also not a big fan of animal experimentation. These kind of experiments are still okay, but when you actually have to uh, isolate the brain of the animal and make a culture with the neurons and study them, uh, and you have to do it. And we do it in order to have an understanding and in order to help, help uh, patients. Unfortunately, we do it. <sighs> Yes, uh, actually, I already talked about the ketamine. Ketamine here is important. Just I put here, I don't know why, but I actually want to come back to our main topic. That what are the research strategies that are aiming to solve the current bottleneck in the understanding of psychiatric diseases and in the way of finding new drugs. One of them is the endophenotype concept. Uh, for example, uh, I told you that the genotype-phenotype concept is very complex. The phenotype it cannot be really, the behavior cannot be really biologically and objectively measured. And from gene to uh, phenotype, geno geno genotype to phenotype is very, you know, distant relationship and something maybe more in the brain level could be considered as endophenotype. And that was already developed in the research. And what is an endophenotype? A neurophysiological, biochemical, endocrinological, neuroanatomical, cognitive, or neuropsychological measure between genotype and disease unseen by unaided eye. So there is genotype, there is a disease condition, but what are the all forms of all these different measures that are associated with that disease state. So in order to solve the complexity of phenotype in psychiatric diseases. So that is one example for you that actually there is some progress in scientific circles to address this enormous complexity. There are so many different approaches, but I just want to show you some little examples because also that is thing I published before. So I mostly talk about the things that I work by myself, not the works of others as far as I can. Uh, that is also, here, how the endophenotypes, for example, can be incorporated into this analysis of the diseases. Here you see genetic factors, environmental factors on the brain of the patient or brain of the individual. And uh, here I put this individual as a behavioral outcome. But if you look at here, of course, we have a genetic variation. As I talked before, there is a pattern of genetic variation, but these are thousands of different genetic variations that can be analyzed by gene chips or microchips that we, not microchips, genetic affimetrix gene chips, for example, it's a brand. So for each individual, it is unique. So, you, but you can have a genetic profile of each individual already by this methodology. So you don't want to deal with one gene, one variation, but thousands of genes, 10,000 of genes, and you can profile them. And you keep it on the side. Then you come here and you scan the brain of the people. How, but you know, this brain scanning, brain imaging technologies are also now developing so well. 
They are becoming more precise than ever, although they still have problems in uh, maybe in terms of precision. Still, for example, they can insert you in a, a functional messenger, functional magnetic resonance scanner, and they can show you some, for example, pictures of emotional states, fearful faces, okay, Dra dramatic pictures or neutral pictures, or they can ask you to remember, you know, some word pairs. And during you do during the process of uh, of this kind of activities or tasks that you were asked, they scan your brain, and they found out the brain regions that are associated with that behavioral task. Okay, and then they check also your real behavioral outcome. To which extent, for example, you can forget the word pairs that are asked you to forget. Word pairs. Apple and chair. You learn it before going into the scanner, okay? And you learn 20 pairs of words, and then you were asked that uh, there is a specific paradigm, you are asked to forget. And then they scan you when you try to forget. And after that, they can check to which extent you were able to forget the things that you want to forget. For example, that's a cognition, cognitive process related to memory. And then they combine all of these things all together and they try to find out a result out of that. Okay, so that was uh, one example of uh, developing new opportunities that are specific for, uh, you know, neuropsychiatric conditions. Any questions so far? Arseni. Ibrahim. Violetta. No? Okay. So, and that is my last slide. Uh, I put it here because uh, actually this technology called optogenetics uh, has been around already uh, for a time. It's not very, very new. But that is especially exciting for research regarding depression, genetics, and circuitry associated with depression. Uh, I just actually, I will not talk about that in detail, but I want you to be aware what is optogenetics. And that is actually, you know, a methodology by which you insert specific genes that are able to produce specific proteins in the cells uh, that are sensitive to light. So our brain cells are not sensitive to light, okay? But uh, if you insert these specific genes, they will produce the proteins that are actually becoming, making the cell sensitive to light, and you can control the cell by the laser light. And if that cell is in the intact brain of the animal, then you can actually control reversibly the behavior of the animal depending on the brain region that you inserted or in fact in, in, that you put that genes. How can you put those genes into the live animal? Any idea? So we don't make a new mice, transgenic mice. We have a mice already. We somehow find a way, so it's not even genome editing. CRISPR, you know, genome editing technology, it's not. It's an adult animal, and then you actually find a way to put some external genes that are actually found in these organisms, okay? These are different proteins encoded by specific genes that are found in some algae species in other organisms. You isolate those genes, and then you actually put these genes into mice. Brain. How can you do that? Yes? Maybe exactly. Yes. Gene therapy. A process called gene therapy that viruses are not only coronavirus. Viruses are very important tools we use in the research. Because virus has the ability to infect your cells. And virus does not have its own machinery to reproduce. That's why they use the cellular machinery. So by the generation of viruses which are not harmful, we use that trait of viruses in order to introduce whatever gene we want to introduce. And then the rest is just you introduce the gene as if you introduce a drug by injection. And it's the virus, and virus is going to infect the injected area, 
and it will transform all the genes that you want to put into the cell. And you can do it in the live organism. And that is called virus-mediated gene expression. And that's the technology that is widely used already, I don't know, for the last 40 years maybe. Okay, uh, but the discovery of the light activating proteins and their genes are not, and their applications in the neuroscience are rather new. And to use it for the, uh, for the virus mediated gene expression. And by this way, you can actually check uh, some uh, prototypical ideas about the uh, genetic architecture of depression and can model it in the mice and can control uh, the mice uh, circuitry. Another way is actually you can uh, develop drugs like ketamine. Ketamine is uh, now known to be very, uh, you know, charming drug candidate. So people are trying to develop some, uh, you know, versions of ketamine that is working in the same system, but not uh, having so many side effects. So ketamine study, ketamine research is a hot topic now for depression uh, drugs uh, in combination with the uh, optogenetics uh, analysis, for example. So in the near future, maybe there will be something completely new drug that is more effective on depression. And then you may remember me. Okay, any questions? Thank you, otherwise.